Uh, he's a president doing his job on the world stage. Yeah, and look, let's see what happens because the different sides are saying different things at the moment. We have no idea. But if this is as billed, then it's great news because until recently, when people thought that those areas were about to be reoccupied, mm. uh, people were saying that's the end of the two-state solution. That's yeah. it. And, they were, and people are already pessimistic about the two-state solution, but that was like we're done. Yep. The fact they're pulling back a little bit, potentially, yep. if this all pans out, that's great news. So let's give credit. Yep. It keeps that dream alive. Uh, and history says uh, the Camp David Accords uh, made Jimmy Carter look very good for about five minutes, didn't win him a second term. But the signing of the Oslo Accords uh, and that moment between Arafat and Yitzhak Rabin in 1993 really helped to prop up Bill Clinton in his first term and helped to pave the way for his re-election in 1996. It was earlier today that the presumptive Democratic nominee Joe Biden called for a nationwide mask-wearing mandate. Take a look. Every governor should mandate, every governor should mandate mandatory mask wearing. The estimates by the experts are it will save over 40,000 lives in the next three months. And unsurprisingly, his newly minted running mate, Kamala Harris, agrees with the boss. We just witnessed real leadership, which is Joe Biden said that as a nation, we should all be wearing a mask for the next three months. Now, Joe Biden has previously said as president he would consider using his powers to impose a nationwide mandate, but as candidate, of course, he has no power at all, so he's calling on state governors, those of them that haven't imposed a mask mandate so far, to enforce one. President Trump is skipping over the whole role of state governors in this and just focusing on the idea that Joe Biden would be an oppressive president, but he himself is still pretty fuzzy on his own policy and advice in this area. My administration has a different approach. We have urged Americans to wear masks. And I emphasized uh, this is a patriotic thing to do. Maybe they're great and maybe they're just good. Maybe they're not so good. But frankly, uh, what do you have to lose? You have nothing to lose. Now, that, what do you have to lose? I mean, that's that's eerily reminiscent of hydroxychloroquine. Yes. Maybe it works, <laughs> maybe it doesn't, but what have you got to lose? Yeah, yeah. It's still a mixed message from, from Trump on all this. It is, and look, this is a smart move from Biden because 82% of people support mask mandates, according to Hill Harris X polls. 34 states already have them. But I don't want to get the constitutional pedant here, but please, can people remember... The federal government cannot institute a mask mandate. It has to, all they can do is lean on states. Has to be the state governor. Please, can people remember that? Please, yeah. Mr. President, if, if Joe Biden, if you become <laughs> president, can you remember that? Yeah. Please. Yeah, and, and <laughs> clearly, uh, you know, Joe Biden in his remarks said, "I don't want to politicise this issue of wearing masks, but I, as somebody who's not president, uh, are saying that people should be wearing masks." So yeah. he does repoliticise it, but he does it as well, knowing. All the estimates for the next three months as the weather cools yeah. in the United States are going to be really bad. And even though it now looks like maybe Biden is taking a bit of a political gamble in calling for this mandate, come November it will probably look very far-sighted and very wise because some of the projections are now saying there could be another 100,000 dead Americans between now and November. Yeah, it really can't hurt. Yeah, all right. Let's uh, take a look at the COVID death toll. Yes. It has just today Which... passed 170,000. And yes. while things do seem to have stabilised a little bit, there are real worries. We've got schools reopening soon, some of them with in-person tuition, colleges as well, some of them with in-person tuition, that this could be how the real second wave starts. Yeah, and the staying at this baseline at the moment, which is so high, it could be extremely high at the end of this. But... So far, as you say, things are stable at the moment. If we look at the daily new cases, they continue to flatline at 55,000 a day. The daily deaths are continuing to flatline a little over 1,000 a day. We don't want to start the second wave from there, though. We want that to get that down. But just for some perspective, these are the top 10 countries in the world with more than a million people for total cases and total deaths per capita. These are total cases per capita. America is sixth in the world. And for deaths per capita, America is eighth. Note that there are different countries in each list. In the most cases per capita, there are a bunch of Middle Eastern countries with immigrant labour camps. And in most deaths per capita, there are a bunch of European countries. But the only countries in both lists are Chile, Brazil, Peru, and America. So, John, that is where America is at, trailing the world with a few developing nations in South America. Yeah, it's not a great situation right now.
All right, then, we've got another guest to talk to. We do. With 81 days to go till the election, John, we're now well in the zone where the Justice Department's not supposed to release any public findings or indictments that could affect the election. Obviously, it didn't work out that way in 2016. <laughs> Probably won't, get, won't work out that way this year either because there's an inquiry by US Attorney John Durham into the origins of the Russia Gate inquiry. It's expected to drop sometime in the next month or so. And we know it's going to make an impact because leaks and classified releases have already provided evidence of still dossier, which was associated with the with Russia Gate, was woefully sourced and presented even more misleadingly. For more, let's talk to a progressive journalist who is more across this story than anyone. Aaron Mate, I spoke to him earlier today. Now, we already knew the Steele dossier was dodgy from the Inspector General's report last year, but what have we learnt new recently, in particular about the person who seems to be responsible for almost all of the dossier's major claims? Well, we've learnt that not only is the Steele report dodgy, which was not hard to guess just based on how ludicrous it was when you read it, but we also learnt that the FBI was told by its so-called primary subsource that it was bunk very early on, in January 2017, right as Trump took office. And what this primary subsource told the FBI was that far from being inside of Russia and having high-level Russian sources, as Steele claimed, this was a guy working at the Brookings Institute in Washington, D.C., who knew a couple of people and basically drew what he – drew his so-called intelligence that he gave to Steele – from going out drinking and hearing some vague uh, hearsay that he then passed on to Steele. And what he also told the FBI is that what Steele put in his report is actually not even what he told Steele, and that Steele himself made a whole bunch of distortions and false claims. So not only did we hear that Steele's so-called source was a joke, but then Steele took his own creative license with the hearsay and rumors that his source told him. And when did he tell the FBI all this again? This was in January 2017. And what is striking about that is that the Steele dossier was used to fuel this public media narrative that Trump was in the pocket of Vladimir Putin. And yet the FBI knew all along that the claims that this came from was a joke. And more, I think, um, more damningly for the FBI, the FBI heard all this, but they still went back to the FISA court, the surveillance court inside the U.S., and got FISA warrants to spy on Trump campaign volunteer Carter Page, Page based on the Steele dossier. So they basically committed fraud on the court knowing that their source, the Steele dossier, was phony, but they hid that from the court to conduct spying on a U.S. citizen. So are you blaming Christopher Steele more here or the FBI? Or is there plenty of blame to go around? I think Christopher Steele deserves a lot of blame here. He lied. He used his imagination to come up with these very serious allegations about some sort of treasonous plot between Trump and Russia, and that had very serious consequences. But at the same time, the FBI is responsible for its own actions as well. And in fact, I actually blame them more because... If the FBI gets some kind of lurid piece of information, they're not required to believe it and take it on faith and use it in an in a application to spy on someone. They didn't do their job. And the question we should ask is why? Why were they so credulous about something so farcical? And why did they commit fraud? At the moment, the right's trying to make this story an Obama-Biden thing rather than solely a Christopher Steele FBI thing. So, in your view, is there much evidence so far pointing to Obama himself directing unethical or illegal activity? I certainly don't think there's any smoking gun of an Obama-Biden role here, but you also can't rule it out. And look, these were actions taken by officials under their watch. It was John Brennan, who was then the head of the CIA, who raised the alarm about the so-called so sweeping Russian interference campaign. And he also tried to get uh, made public in his discussions with key lawmakers in the summer of 2016. He tried to get made public suspicions about collusion between Trump and Russia. So all these people working right under Obama and Biden certainly did play a key role. And perhaps we'll find out if it went even higher than them. And how much confidence do you have in the Durham inquiry? Do you think it's likely to get to the bottom of this all or is it just a political weapon? Well, the problem is this thing has become so, part so partisan 
that it is now a political weapon. I mean, look at Trump. He's completely mishandled this pandemic. The I think the worst response of any government in the world, aside from Brazil. And so he especially needs something to help deflect blame from that. In the same way, the Democrats needed Russiagate to deflect blame for them losing to Trump back in 2016. So I think Trump will be applying heavy pressure for some indictment or some damning revelation to come out and come out very soon to help him in the election. And as for Durham, I don't know. I don't, you know, he has a bipartisan reputation as being credible. Although for people who wanted to see accountability for the CIA torture program, which he investigated, you know, he was a disappointment to many people. So, you know, it's tough. Look, before, right before Trump took office, Chuck Schumer went on national TV and said that, you know, you don't want to anger the intelligence community. He was talking about Trump. He said Trump does not want to go against the intelligence community because they have seven ways from Sunday to get back at you. And I think that that is a intimidating factor here for everybody is that, you know, intelligence officials have a lot of power. And no matter what side of the aisle you're on, there's going to be some reluctance to go and seek full accountability because there are consequences. The intelligence community can get back at you and they can do damage. So we'll see. I, but it certainly is interesting. And there has to be something because there's been a huge buildup. And this thing was such a, a fraud. You know, there was all these leaked claims that were just not true, trying to paint a false picture of a Trump-Russia collusion plot. And so, you know, hopefully there'll be some accountability for that. And, you know, no matter how you feel about Trump, the intelligence services should not be weaponized for political ends. Finally, there's such a vast trove of information out there about this topic, it's almost impossible to follow it all, even when it's your job. So what are your key takeaways for our viewers? And what lessons do you think most need to be learned? Well, one takeaway is that no matter how you feel about a president, even somebody as vile as Donald Trump, that intelligence services should not be weaponized for partisan ends. We don't want to have the FBI and the CIA playing such an, a huge role in domestic politics where it becomes this thing where we are told to basically revere intelligence officials, not question anything they say, and we don't mind, we're supposed to not mind if even they commit fraud to investigate a political campaign that we don't happen to like. I don't want to accept that standard because I don't want to see that same abuse of power used against candidates that I like. You know, Bernie Sanders is who I support, and I don't want to see a Bernie Sanders investigated and undermined by intelligence officials because some of them don't like what he says about a certain foreign policy issue. It just, that's not how politics should work. So no matter what our partisan affiliation is, we should agree that intelligence officials should not have that kind of power, not have that kind of role in domestic politics. And more broadly, I don't think we should let people with their own narrow agenda set the agenda for everybody else. So in the case of Trump and Russia, you had a convergence of Democratic neoliberals who lost to Trump, joining forces with intelligence officials. Both of these parties had their very narrow reasons for opposing Trump, but they, those interests were not in the, in the interest of the broader public. It was for their own political ends. So I think one lesson to learn from this is to be skeptical of everyone's claims and to not fall for easy fixes. It was very convenient for many people to believe that Trump was a Russian agent and all we had to do was just sit back and let Robert Mueller do his job. That's not how politics works. Politics works by engaging people around issues that impact their lives and mobilizing and being out in the streets, not being, you know, spectators to this inter-elite soap opera and spy thriller. So I'm hoping that the collapse of Russia Gate and just the exposure of just how much fraud was used to wage it will help it lead to a new kind of politics where we're not distracted and not immersed in these inter-elite dramas. And that is all for another Fireside Chat. If you missed this week's Planet America, it is on ABC iView and online now, and we will see you at the old time of 9.30pm Wednesday night on ABC TV for a Democratic Convention special. Do not miss it. And even more, don't miss this week's pet <laughs> podcast. You'll find that right there. Good night. Bye -bye.